Uh, Clive, when I went onto your website, the homepage says, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, and I suspect you will be remembered as the World Cup winning head coach who led England's rugby team to World Cup glory in Australia in 2003. Who amongst us can ever forget? Not only was it the first time England won, but the first time any nation in the Northern Hemisphere won the Rugby World Cup. And still the only Northern Hemisphere nation, am I right? I think so, yeah. 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 Um, you then became Team GB's Director of Sport in the London Olympics in 2012, delivering Team GB's most successful Olympic Games in modern times. And you're now a sports and business consultant and founder of Hive Learning, an app which digitizes your coaching methods. Thank you for joining us this evening, Clive. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for that introduction. I've forgotten most of those things. So, uh, it's <laughs> None of the rest of us have, Clive. None of the rest of us have. Uh, we're also joined tonight by a virtual audience as this podcast is being recorded as an Intelligence Squared Plus online event. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. Please let us know in the audience chat where you are joining from. Tonight's event is going to run for about one hour. For the first half, I'm going to be in conversation with Clive. And then in the second half, we're going to be taking your questions. So please do start by sending them in. Click on the Ask Question button under the video screen, type in your question, and then press Send. And we promise to get through as many as we can uh, in the time available. So, Clive, we, we thought just to sort of break the ice, we'd start, as we always do in these podcasts, with a quick, uh, no, no bullshit leadership, quick fire round. So a couple of quick fire questions to get us going, and then we'll get into the meat of it. Um, in three words, describe your leadership style. Uh, leadership, teamship, and partnership. If you could delete any word from the uh, leadership jargon dictionary, um, what word would that be? Oh, that's easy. I hate the word. I'm going to reach out to you. Don't know where <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah. uh, which leader do you most admire? Either. Sorry. Which leader? Do you, which leader do you most admire? Either present, past. Which leader? Yeah. Uh, I've been supporting Alex Ferguson by a long way, but always admired him from uh, yeah, Alex Ferguson. Although I'm a big Chelsea fan. I hate Man United, but Ferguson was the best leader I've come across in sport by a long way. Uh, and what's the best advice you've ever been given? Uh, write things down. Be, be, be curious. But I think write things down because you think you may remember them, but you can't. So... Uh, uh, I've always, I've even now got a pen, just in case I'll learn something from you, Chris. So, <laughs> that's, uh, that's unlikely, but, but let's see. It's flattering, nevertheless. Uh, what's the best decision you've ever made? Uh, we went to live in Australia, um, I think, to go and work abroad. I, I, I went there when I was 29. So I think uh, I was there for five years. I had a two-year contract with Xerox. I stayed there five years. So just to work abroad was really excellent time of our life. You know, I, I think it just makes you... In, independent and I'd, I'd, I'd uh, advise that to anybody if there's a chance of working abroad to do it. And the worst decision you've ever made? Probably not to go to Australia about five years earlier. I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks for that, Clive. So now let's get into the let's get into a, a, a bit more detail. Um, I had a look at your website uh, before tonight's recording, and it asks, and I mentioned this in the in the introduction. How do you want to be remembered? Uh, I was presumptuous enough to answer that question for you, but but how how do you want to be remembered as a leader and a coach? I, I think. Um... When you're in, in leadership positions, you know I, I love the word trust and respect. I always, I've always, you know, when people ask me about other leaders, yeah, about Alex Ferguson, you kind of trust and respect. And I think the key thing is trust. I want to absolutely clear, but you, you, you don't get those names associated with you just because you happen to be the leader or the head coach or chief executive. You get them just by the quality of your actions. And you know, I always say to leaders, you, you, you are there to set the example, and you know. It's, it's not rocky science. It's you got to throw the kitchen sink at it. And certainly from a sporting point of view, you, I, I kind of still think as a player, you, you know the coaches who are re-delivering really what they're doing. You know the coaches who are maybe taking a few a few shortcuts. So, you know, if I hear players talk about me, my time with England and what I do now, they use words trust and respect. That, that, that kind of gives me a nice warm feeling. But you just do it by the quality of what you do. And you know, I'm there to make every single person better at their job. And, and you've had some incredible highlights so far. What was the highlight for you, whether it be a, a kind of a, a real sort of headline uh, achievement or maybe some specific moment within that? What's, the, what's been the highlight? 
I've, I've been very lucky about being across the, the Rugby World Cup win was, was huge because, you know, I, I didn't take the England job on to actually win the Rugby World Cup. I took that job on to try and make England the best team in the world, I mean, the number one ranked team in the world. So to get to number one in, in the world was a huge achievement, and that's kind of excellent over a whole long period of time. But that one night in Sydney was just the kind of the absolutely icing on the cake. Everybody could see this was a very special team. And that, that was just amazing, you know. But we had a fantastic team of people, and, and I'm still close to all the normal coaches, all my staff, all, all the players. You just did something that was so special. And, you know, and then, as you said, no one's ever done that before from our part of the world. So that was that would be the, the highlight. But I've, I've always been pleased. So I moved on from rugby pretty quick. I kind of had a bit of fallout for a few, one or two people at Twickenham after the World Cup and left. And I had a year of professional football. I love football. I had a year of professional football, which I love. I'm a fully qualified football coach. So even getting that qualification, I was usually proud of. And the Olympic Games, I was, wasn't just um, London. I was in charge of the, the sporting side of the team in uh, Beijing in 2008, Vancouver, the Winter Olympics, up to London 2012. So I had huge highlights all, all through that. But what I've been kind of most proud of, I've been very looking, looking, and I've not finished yet by a long way, um, no, no, we'll come to that. It's actually just, you know, moving on and not sort of, you know, it's great talking about World Cups and all that sort of stuff. I, yeah, I move on pretty quickly to find new challenges, new things to do. And, you know, I still love rugby. I enjoy, enjoy watching the game, but I've never never kind of regretted moving on from, from the game of rugby. Did, did you, I mean, that, the, the, the World Cup in particular, obviously is such, a, such an iconic, uh, such an iconic uh, final, not just the winning, but the way it was won. Did, are you the sort of person that, that manages to find time to enjoy the moment? I think Johnny Wilkinson sort of famously said, didn't he, that he sort of enjoyed it for about two seconds and then just felt a sense of relief. Or were you able to just really, at the time, reflect on what you'd achieved and sit back and enjoy it? You probably reflect on it more so now, really, just talking to you. You look back at a lot of warm feelings at the time, and the word used there was relief. To me, it was just a massive relief when that final whistle went. You know, it was just thank goodness for that. <laughs> the scary thing was, Chris, you know, we, we were number one ranked team in the world. We were famous to win that game. If we'd not won that game, I, I wouldn't be speaking and talking to you now all these years later. So, that, <laughs> I mean, it's true, your whole life changed at the time. And also, you, you know, you just know there's no second chance. That was never going to happen again. There's no next week or try again. That, that was it. And if we'd not won that game, I haven't a clue how I would have turned out. I don't think probably very well. And I don't think any of us would have because we knew it was a chance of a lifetime. And that was that was pressure. But the, the pressure was great. You wouldn't stop me for anything. I love the pressure of it where everything's at stake. And, you know, to actually win it in such sort of dramatic fashion was was. Amazing. So you just feel very lucky that you you can't take that away from people. You kind of got it, but you don't, you can't be sitting talking about it the rest of your life. You've got to move on by new challenges, mm -hmm. new, new, which I'm really pleased I've been able to do. I I, I remember, and I, I'm not uh, I'm not trying to compare the two, but I, but I remember when I first found myself in a in a in this in a leadership position, as in right at the the, the top of a business. And I don't think I felt this at the time, but looking back. I don't really think I had a very clear philosophy at the time as to what I knew what I wanted to achieve, but I don't think I had a very clear leadership philosophy of my own. I mean, when you first became the, the head coach, did you have a clear plan for how you were going to go about it? Or did you think, did your thinking evolve as you went through? Do, do you want the truth or? Do you... <laughs> yeah, we definitely want the truth. <laughs> I I didn't have a clue what I was doing. You know, I, I can I can look back now. I can say all these wonderful things, but when I say I didn't have a clue, of course I did. But the when I got the England rugby job, the, I think the key thing everyone should, should understand. I had kind of two careers in business before that. Game was out. So I worked for Xerox, ranked Xerox for eight years, uh, including five in Australia. So you know, and I was I was uh, a good kind of graduate trainee, and I was a sales director in Sydney. So I had a, a big corporate background. But probably most importantly, when we came back from Australia. Uh, I set up my own small leasing and finance company based on the skills I learned with Xerox Finance. We're a small brokerage. So when I say small, it's about 10 people. They also ran for eight, eight years. So I had a big corporate background in terms of Xerox, graduate training and all that sort of stuff. But probably the most important thing was running your own company where you've got 10 people in the room. And when you think about it, there's, there's no difference. Running your rugby team is a small business. you know. And I really look back at that time running my own small finance company uh, that, that was the key skills I learned in terms of taking over the, 
the rugby team. I couldn't write it down or anything, but you just you just throw the kitchen sink at it. You just work in it every hour that I was, I was gone. You realise you've got to really listen to your people. You've got to make them engage with it. But, you know, we were talking about OHR. at 10 people sat in a room, and we took on some big, big guys and some of these big deals. I had a lot of fun. I learned so much in that eight years. I learned more in that eight years than, than, than any, anything else. And so when you took the rugby team, um, there's no difference, you know. I think when I think about, you know, r- r- rugby, and sport, uh, r- rugby and business, you know, you're delivering results through people. That's what leadership's about. You're not delivering it through yourself. Mm-hmm. It's results through people. When you think of it, that's the definition of a, of a rugby team, a football team, any business team. You just you just find your ways to really you know engage and empower your team and away away you go. And uh, I, I kind of loved it. This was this interesting. You know, whilst I love coaching England, I love running my own business. There was no, no greater buzz than being absolutely the guy in charge. Everything's on the line. You know, school fees, a house. You know, there's, there's no no one looking after you. <laughs> and it's it, it's it's tough. But I went somewhere to the world and. But I learned from both. I, I, was, you know, I learned from a, a big corporate background and I le- learned especially from running my own small company. And when I took the rugby team, often the players would probably used to drive them nuts. They used to refer to business all the time with them about what we did and how we did things, you know. And, um, you know, I, I like to think they learned quite quite a bit. And I, I made no difference in business, you know, and we're here to win. And that, that's, that's the game. I mean, it's fascinating. I've heard you talk a lot about this balance between, um, not balance, but the, the, the similarities, I guess, and differences between leadership in business and leadership in sport. And often in, in, in business, I think sometimes people talk about sports leadership in, slight, in, in a rather cliched way and sometimes, I think. Um, but you have a huge amount of experience in both. It's not just rugby, as you touched on. You know, it's the Olympics. It's the skiing now. It's your own business, uh, current own business hive, which we'll come to. What do you think are the big similarities and potentially differences between leadership in a sports context and leadership in a business context? I, I honestly don't think there is, Chris. I, I really, really don't. I, you know, I'm sure if you put... Um... Pep Guardiola or, or Klopp in charge of a leasing company and said, This is the way you're going to make <laughs> They would be successful. You know, and I, I think, and that's what I said, you know, I, I really love running my own company. Like, you know, they love running football teams. I love running the rugby team. I really enjoyed it. I, it wasn't the day I got up there, oh, I'm going to work today. It was a business that was fun through people, you know, and the, 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 biggest, the biggest thing, the kind of the, 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 the two key skills get is just what I call relentless learning. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you're always learning. You're always learning. There's no doubt. You look at these great football managers, and I, you know, I obviously love football, so I follow them closely. But they're always learning, always trying to find new things, new edges. They're not sitting there thinking, "Oh, great, we 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 cracked it. Just let's carry on." Learning is everything, and and the key thing is if you get the learning done through your people. So it's not just yourself who is a relentless learner. You're 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 encouraging every single person in the, in the team. One of my favourite sayings in in the, in the rugby team: "There's no such thing as a dumb idea," you know, because sometimes. A new player would come into the team, you know, even a young Johnny Wilkinson. When Johnny came into the England rugby team, he was 18, amazing young man, superstar player. But he was so shy. He was so quiet. He was almost intimidated by the more senior players, you know, Johnson and Delaware, Leonard, his heroes. And then you got me asking him to stand up and speak in front of his players, and he just couldn't. You know, so but I, you know, I made, it, made it clear, well, you've got to get everybody involved, even if it'll be in their day, because they could have the... the the killer idea. So you've got to get the learning, you know, and if you've got an idea, you say it, you stand up, don't, doesn't matter if you leave yourself open for some banter or ridicule, let me decide whether it's a good or bad idea. And I kind of, my kind of leadership style, when it was one of your first questions, you know, what, I actually almost pride myself on not being good at new ideas. What I pride myself on is listening and making sure all these players are really proud to think, think about things. And then what I am thinking I'm quite good at, if I think that's a good idea that you've thought about, that's going to, you know, in sporting terms, make the boat go faster. I'll move heaven and earth to get it done. You have to do it. That's your job. So if this is going to make you a better team, win more gold medals, make the boat go faster, we will do it. We'll get it done. doesn't matter what it costs. It has to happen. But you're there to kind of strike off the ones who don't think are any good. But if they do think they're going to be good, you're going to move, move forward. And we became really good at that. I, I think looking back at the, the rugby team, which we keep referring to, you know, amazing team, you know, talent-wise. But what <coughs> Don't see just the input, the passion, the knowledge, the thought. They're all playing for their own clubs, all coming together because they knew we could win this thing. They knew we had the talent and players, but so so, you know, so the other other team. But could we kind of run this in a different way where we really do, you know, take no shortcuts, not be scared of trying new things, not be scared of failure because that's how you're going to win. 
I, I mean, I, I love listening to you talk about that because I know you and I have a shared sort of passion, if that's the right word, for the power of culture within a, within an organisation to drive that organisation success, success or, or, if you get it wrong, failure. And I think your example there, it, to me, is a great example of the role of a leader because Johnny Wilkins or, 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 or you know, or, or whoever it is, a more, you know, even in our own normal human worlds, people who aren't superheroes like Johnny Wilkinson, uh, you know, it's the leader's role is to, you know, without you, he doesn't stand up and, and speak, does he? I mean, your role there is to create the culture and the environment to make that happen. Um, and I think that's a critical role for leaders. I think one of my, you know, I, I love these sayings. Uh, and none of them are mine, by the way. I don't know where I get them from. I just, you know, I always put my name by them if they're any good, but they're, they're certainly not mine. <laughs> <laughs> the sign of a great leader. But when I'm, when I'm thinking about this, you know, one of my favorite things, you know, and I said this to players, great teams made of great individuals. And I repeat it. Great teams made of great individuals. What, what I find when you're talking to people, because they think there's some magic formula, they, they think it's, there's some magic teamwork going on, which which, which I don't quite um, agree. I think if there is a secret to, to great teams, if, if, if you as a leader, my job with the rugby team is to make every individual player better. So I'm going to make... Martin Johnson, Johnny Wilkinson, Lawrence Delali, and my job is to make them better at what they do. And if, if basically, if you get every individual, think of your business people, your, your sales people, your marketing people, your four-lift truck driver, if you invest in them and you're going to try and make that individual better, you know, they will give it back to you in, in, in bucket loads. And I really do mean it. And they'll, they'll know whether you're bullshitting or not. So is this guy delivering? Is he making me a better player? And then if you, in a, in a, in a, in a sports team or a business team, you look around the room, and suddenly you see all these amazing individuals who are superstar players. Team stuff, Chris, becomes quite easy to do, you know, because you've got this incredible talent, and, but you're investing in them all, all the time. Mm. Uh, I don't think any businesses quite get that. They, they think there's this magic formula to create teamwork, and I, I think you can never in, invest ever in training, making people better at what they do, because you will get it back in, in bucket loads. Mm. That's how I've always worked, you know, and hence a rugby team's quite interesting because – it's, it's so different than even a football team because there's so many different positions and different sizes. You know, you've got big guys, fast guys, tall guys, everyone. It's very mm. specific. So I want to make every single player as best I possibly can. And that's a huge challenge because that keeps you awake at night. But when I'm running my business from, you know, the, the, from the, from the, the secretary to the market, I'm trying to, you know, what, what have I got to do to make you better at your job? And if you do that, you, they, they won't forget that. And that's why I spoke before about trust and respect. I think you get that. And if you do it, if you just talk about it and you talk a good game, you know you, you can't you can't hide from these people. They know whether you're delivering or not. I, and and that, that takes me to I, would, I I could talk to you about the, the the rugby team all night, but I also want to talk about the Olympics. I remember when I first met you, uh, I felt like I you know I, I, I you know as a rugby fan, I'd watched a lot of the rugby, but I and I hadn't fully appreciated uh, the the difference in the role that you took within the Olympic team, and it, it struck me. That, that you've just compared to the rugby team to, let's say, a kind of a, a, a sort of a startup business almost. The, the Olympic, if, if that, to, to extend that analogy, the Olympic team was like running a kind of huge corporation, I suppose, in terms of scale. What, what, were, the, what were the differences in terms of the leadership style you had to um, pursue, I suppose, uh, uh, as director of sport at the Olympics? Yeah, it was a very different job, Chris. I mean, in, in the rugby team, I'm, I'm the head coach, I'm Pep Guardiola, I'm the changing room, I'm in charge of my team. The Olympic team, I was kind of overseeing the 26 sports, you know, so my, my job was to make sure these 26 sports really operated together. And there were 26 totally different businesses, you know, from British Cycling to Dave Brailsford, some amazing teams. And then but the, the whole range of sports in terms of different cultures, different personality, different fundings, you know, British boxing, taekwondo, hockey. So you've got 26 totally different businesses. Uh, and that was silos, that's the best way to look at it. Very different. Some of these sports didn't even get on with each other, you know, because they were competing for funds from UK mm. sports. So there wasn't a lot of love, love lost between some of these sports and people. It still surprised me, because I got the offer of this job, I came out of the blue, I was about looking at a football manager, and uh, a guy called Colin Moynihan, who used to be the Minister of Sport, Lord, Mo Lord Moynihan, who I'd met a couple of times, I really liked, he was a, got hold of me, and he said, look, we've won the bid, we know you're in football, but we're going to create this new job, and it's not quite what we want to do, because it's more of a an admin role because I'm overseeing these coaches. I had to go head to head with all these pretty aggressive, you know, winners like Brailsford and, and, and try and sort of create a team. It was amazing. Looking back, I'm really glad I did it. It was an amazing job. Um, I tried to see first time because it allowed me to go behind the scenes. You know, I could go behind the scenes to all these sports. 
you know, I had the saying about being a sponge or a rock, and I'm a total sponge. I'll go anywhere if it means I can learn something. And just to sit in the back of team rooms and cycling athletics, or just see the way different things will run. But also, you can see there's, there you know, when you, you know, when you look at these superstar athletes, you know, from, from Bradley Wiggins to Victor Pendleton to Rebecca Addington, Johnny Wilkinson, Mark Johnson, they're actually the same. You, when, when you, they're just doing different sports. They're incredibly driven. And, and they and they want to win, but also what what Robert Kemp got really clear was you know it's not just one way. They don't, they don't just sit there and listen to the coaches. They they work with the coach. They question the coach, and their knowledge of their sports, like you know I talked about relentless learning before. Their knowledge, mm-hmm. and then, then it was only then I start to write things down and try and work out what on earth I had done with the rugby team. Because until <laughs> then I was just throwing everything at it. But then I was able to actually see why we were successful and what the comparisons were with. Some Olympic sports that were successful, and some of the sports that weren't so successful. It's a business. It was back to the delivering results through people. But it was a great job. But I was more in an administration role. And, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't plain sailing. I was really surprised at the animosity between some of these sports because you kind of watch on TV like we've all done the Olympic Games, amazing TV. You see Team GB and all the nice tracksuits and walking around. Behind the scenes, it's not quite like that. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of anxiety, tensions, a lot of personalities, a lot of blow ups. And my job was to make sure that didn't happen, basically. Um, I loved it. it was, you know, obviously not named names. There was a few people I just couldn't believe the way they went about doing the job because it wasn't what I was used to. So I was surprised in many ways, but I loved it. Unfortunately, London turned out to be really successful, which was great. And, I mean, is that where you developed your, your uh, or uh, I suppose, formulated your concept of teamship? I mean, do, do you want us to talk a bit about that? No, the team ship came from a small business. What, what, what team ship is? Right. You know, I, I kind of read a lot of. Um, for every one sports book I read, I read ten business books. But uh, I've never read about team ship. And all, all team ship is it's very very simple. But is if, if I, I try and make it as simple as possible. If I'm using my own small company, I'm the leader of the team. The ten people in my team have been too dramatic. I wanted the team to discuss. You know what we're going to do about certain things, what our standards are going to be, our behaviours, and all this sort of stuff. And literally, I wouldn't be in the room. And I'd ask one of the team to, you know, have a chat about it all, the whole thing, and kind of report back to me and say, "What do you think?" And then it can become what a team should rule if you get a hundred percent agreement from the team. But most important, the leader also agrees. So if the team comes back with an idea, this is what we want to do. We all agree this is the way to do this. Um, if you don't like it, you still back it back. So it's not democracy, you're not giving any, any power away. But it's what I said before, you actually, you're, you're showing your team, I am listening to you, I do I do respect and understand you. But fundamentally, I still think as a player, I could still remember sitting there as a rugby player, thinking, God, if I was in, doing this job, I'd be doing it differently than this. So it's just empowering your, your team. I call it teamship. And it's it's it's, it's, it's not easy. It's got to be delivered by the, the leaders, got to drive it, drive it, drive it. And in the England rugby team, we literally had hundreds of team ship rules, hundreds. You know, not, and obviously some to do with playing the game, but most of our behaviours. My favourite one was a uh, was time. I think time, if you use time for example, um, I think time says more about an individual or team of people. Anything I think of, punctuality. You know, I'm never late ever. There have to be a serious incident for me not have time for somebody. But you know, so I sat down with the team one day. I went through all my definition of punctuality: that starting on time, finishing all this sort of stuff. So I want to know your definition. So I literally left the room. And this is what they're, they're, you know, this is why they were so good. You know, Martin Johnson especially, he got this. So I came back in and John, I gave me a bit of paper and he said, you know, we get this, um, uh, our definition of time will be 10 minutes early. So if you call a meeting tonight to start at 7 o'clock, uh, we'll be in the, all the room by 6.50. So you, the leader, read this. You're going to accept this. And 10 minutes early is totally possible in a sporting team. So it's not, it's not in a business thing in that sense. So you sign off on it. And then you kind of name it. We named it, named it Lombardi time um, mm. after an American football coach called Vince Lombardi. And I promise you, anybody listening to this call, if you ever meet any rugby player who played under me, just go Lombardi time and they'll go 10 minutes early. And even now I meet players, everyone's 10 minutes early and they laugh. And it, it, it's a culture. So your teamship will create your culture. The most important thing, if I'd gone to the team and go, right, here's the rules, 10 minutes early, they will all just hold their arms and go, this is all bullshit. Why we... I put it around the mm-hmm. because you get them to discuss it, them to decide it, and also most importantly, them to agree it. They they take ownership of it and they get hugely proud of it. If anybody was late, what well, doesn't need me to tell them that the team would call it out. If you want to win, you can have these amazing teamship rules, and 
what it allows you to, you know, if you think what's happening today in today's world with you know, all that's going on in Black Lives Matter, what, what Teams allows you to get those things out on the table, get them discussed. Don't hide behind anything. I think if people did that a lot more often and encourage your team, if there's anything you think you should be doing better or you're not happy with, get it out on the table, get it on the table, create a team should all around it. And it's, it's just so mm. simple. And I've never read about it in any book. A bit all mm. powerful. A bit got to be driven by the leader of the, the actual team. So the lead, the kind of the leader, the leader, it almost instigates that way of work, that way of uh, not working almost, but that that culture, I suppose. But as I understand it, the, the team almost, I'm trying to avoid using the word police because that's too uh, hard, but the team, the team self enforces those rules, right? I mean, it's not for you to, to sort of say, hang on, I'm going to tell you off. It's that they, they hold themselves to those rules that they themselves have set. What, what happens is we're trying to be the best team in the world. And literally, no one's ever late. No one's ever late. It didn't need policing. And this isn't a contract, mm. a firm shake of hands between mm. this and we operate. I've agreed to do this. That's how we're going to work. And But most yeah. important, every member of the team. So, you know, obviously, something can arrive late. Things can happen. But if somebody then knowingly arrives late, you've got a major problem. It never happened to me because people, mm. people yeah, there be hundreds of them. You know, just, just mm. behavior, language. Where we dressed in restaurants, all sorts of stuff, and we were. And, but when you know you've really cracked it, is yes, I can put an idea out. When you know you've really cracked it, when your team comes to you, so let's discuss this. Can we discuss this? Can we discuss this? And then you go on from. It never stops. You're always adding something. You're always tweaking them. You're always building on them. But that that in the rugby team that won, that they're, 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 the way they operated off the foot of play was just the best I've ever seen in any business or any any sport. And then you can move it onto the field of play. We you start to discuss, you know, what we're going to do from here, here, and here, because you're always brains. And I'm just saying we need to use these brains. These, 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 just because they play doesn't mean they're not clever. They're incredibly bright, and they understand the game they want to win. So it's just called teamship, and, you know, I, I wouldn't know any other way of working with any team of people. I, I couldn't. I just know how to do it. I'm mm-hmm. running, you know, a golf club, amateur committee. That's how I do it. Same thing. You need to have a clear way of working that we're all happy with. And, but and, mm-hmm. but if you have... If it's nine out of ten people say yes, we'll do it this way, and one says no, it cannot become a team ship because that uh, that person might be right. That could be the killer idea. It's not just mm-hmm. a majority of rules. You could have every single person. That's what we're going to do. And there'll come a stage where you, as the leader, go, okay, we're just going to get on with this now. Even if I'm not quite there, we'll, we'll try it for a couple of months until we get on with this because you can change it. And mm-hmm. it's all, all, all powerful. But it's certainly my style of leadership. Uh, so team ship is a style of leadership. It's not a one off set of projects, so the style of leadership where you really are engaging with your team and, and listening and taking what they're, they're saying very, very importantly. I, I, I love, in a way, fitting these two, these two big concepts we talked about together, this idea of creating an environment where everybody gets to speak. You talked about the Johnny Wilkinson example. You know, you're creating an environment where he or she, whoever, whatever the context is, is able to say whatever's on their mind, a worry, a concern, an idea, and at the same time, then having an, having a framework for a discussion and a decision with the group as to whether that is something they're going to embrace and 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 work with, um, it's kind of two sides of the same coin in some ways. To be, to be, to be, to be, to be very clear, in, in the team room, we had some undingers. Just because you now win a World Cup, everyone seems to think it's something wonderful. It's, it, it wasn't. Sometimes it got really uh, quite tasty in there. If you know what I mean? Because once a win, there were and some big guys. <laughs> <laughs> it all picked up at times, but the team shit rule was: there's nothing wrong with disagreeing in the team room. But when, you know, but but quite simply, the team shit rule: when we walk out that door, we all walk out the door holding hands. There's mm-hmm. nothing about that team room. But we want disagreement. We want questions. We want arguments. We want people calling people out. That's what high performing teams do. But no one ever fell out. There's never not quite any blood on the carpet. But we had a few few moments. Where you've got to go, guys, calm down, calm down. You know, and especially with some of the, looking at some of the games we lost, you know, we did some of the analysis on the, on the TV. You know, and someone said, What were you doing? What were you doing? <laughs> because, uh, you shouldn't have said that to him. And he exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so we, even even that was team shit rules. That when, and the team room was a magic place. We had this, you know, I put a lot of stall on the team room, which is it's kind of more than a boardroom, and we made it a place where when that door was shut, right, it wasn't there for a chat, but what what it has, it was quite noisy because I wanted them coming in with thoughts and ideas. 
and I would, you know, it wasn't me delegating. I would just say, what do you think? What do you think? So you get opinions through them. You know, then you've got the coaches who are no angels either, you know, Andy Robinson and Phil Lard and these guys. They were all whining yeah. as well. So it became quite a hostile place at times, but it was, you wouldn't swap it for the world. You know, but also my, my company, every, every now and then it all kicked off in that because we something did, we didn't do it right or, or whatever. And, you know, we had to say, that's where I learned it from. I really learned teamship, that small company. And, you know, we may kick off and say things in that room, but we just walk outside the door, high five each other, and get on with it. You know, we, we, we set our piece now. And was mm. another Leave it on the way behind was another one of my favorite. You know, it's done now. It's going to move on. We're out of the door. Let's get on with it. I, I I always I definitely think that with effective teams you you have to be able to disagree and disagree is a polite way of putting it but without falling out you know you need to be able to have a real old proper row and then at the end of it say let's go for you know we're, we're both coming we're both arguing about this because we deeply care let's get it out let's get let's get it said and then let's go for a pint or, or, or whatever it is you you want to do afterwards because I think if you don't that's when you get to politics schisms people don't say their things that they feel they, they you tension build up i've spoken to i spoke to alex ferguson about this spoke to toto wolf about this and they say the same thing they we almost laugh everyone thinks because you win is this beautiful thing and actually it isn't that beautiful you know and uh but that's why they all like but they love it i love it i loved it i love the kind of confrontation within the team room because we wanted to win we did want to win and we're trying to create these amazing standards and um i think and i said the players loved it they absolutely loved it because they mm. knew they could, and and the, and, the, and the kind of the humour also was all, all, all part of it. But you know that's what high-performing teams do. Sometimes it's not this wonderful, wonderful place. That's not the real world because you mm. things do go wrong. You have you have big losses, you know, and all this sort of stuff. So it, it, it can happen, and and you and you find out a lot about yourself in those situations as well. Uh, you, you talked earlier about about the the, the best you know the, the the great teams are made up of great individuals um, uh, and and you, you you I've heard you talk before about the the DNA of a champion that that just talent alone isn't enough. Uh, what makes a champion if not just talent? Uh, we well, I mean clearly a champion you've got to have talent because you start yeah. with that. You, you can't take someone off the street and put them into a racing car or an England scrum or wherever. So you have to have the talent, but I, I just think, I, I think everyone's got talent. I don't think a lot of people realise how, how talented they actually are. Uh, but once you've got talent, and if you really want to try and leverage it to the talent, um, the, the, the biggest thing I, I come back to is this, your ability to learn and really take ownership of your, your own programme. Yes, you want to work with your coach and do things like that. You should listen to your coaches. But, you know, I, I love this term, relentless learning, where you're actually, and this is what I encourage your players to do, I'm, I'm encouraging them to go out and study, find out, come back to me. What do you think? How can we do this? How can we do do that? And that, that's what that's what champions do. I mean, Steve Redgrave, when he was 16, was was nowhere. He's now the most successful Olympic athlete. He was 16 years old. You know, he hardly could get in a boat. But he went on to be convinced by his sheer knowledge of what to do, how to do it, both physically, mentally, and he took really ownership of his own program. And that's why I see a lot of these champion athletes. You know, they their knowledge what they do is amazing you know and then on top of that you know i use the word attitude i like the word attitude chris I think attitude is a great word um but i don't think people are born with attitude i think you can coach attitude so i break attitude down into 10 areas and each of these 10 areas there's a whole presentation on each one of them but it allows me to measure attitude and it is things like punctuality it's, it's been like, um, uh, obsession and these these are the words it adds up to he, as he or she got the right attitude so if you get somebody who's relentless learning, got the right attitude, and they've got talent, you can take them in anywhere. And um, that's why I look at it. So this is all, you know, I kind of developed this thinking over a long, long period of time, and now you, you look at people and you can and you, and you can measure. If I'm coaching them, I'm very clear the coaching process. You know, I might think I can prove anybody from a chief executive to a, you know, scrum off. You know, it's the same process. You just go through the same process. But you absolutely know one thing, they've got to get involved in this. It's going to be a two-way piece of work. You know, if you think I'm going to sit here and just do all this for you, it's not going to work that way. And that's not going to make you successful. You've got to really become passionate about this yourself and start to get really kind of aggressive in a, in a positive way with what you actually do and what your working day looks like if you want to be the best in the world. I, I'd like to talk to you briefly about innovation as well. We, we 
well, we're hopefully coming to the end of a very, very strange time in all of our lives. And certainly in, in business, that's going to mean a huge amount of change. And I think some some creative destruction probably as well. And I think we're going we're to see as a consequence that a huge amount of innovation in all sorts of parts of our, our, our business lives, all aspects of our lives. How, how, what role has innovation, conscious innovation played in your uh, sort of leadership journey? Do you see yourself as an innovator, as a leader? Um. No, no, I've never even thought about it, to be fair. What, what, what I've always believed in, and this probably comes from my materials background, whoever wins in IT tends to win. I've said that for the last 40, 50 years. <laughs> IT tends to win. Of sports, I promise you, is no different than any anything else. And certainly in the sporting world, when I became the director of rugby coach, that was the first time I was a full-time professional coach. I was, you know, I mean, we had no excuses. And I went massive on the IT side, massive, in terms of, because... You know, there's, there's no point having all these wonderful programs unless the players can understand it as well. You have all the coaches working on all the ITs and there's amazing software to do. But what we did was, at the time, probably, you know, when I first got the rugby team, less than 5% of the team had a clue how to use a laptop computer. And the players from Leicester, my, my club, couldn't spell laptop computer. So this was going to be <laughs> quite, quite challenging. But, you know, some of the players go, what are you, what are you doing? You know, they're on the press. Yeah, I'd had a fair field day, you know, because all these tough nut players are walking into the hotel with their laptop computers. And that's the season of guys now. There's one, one guy, but what on earth is he doing? What, is, what has a laptop computer got to do with playing rugby? Why is he not getting all raw meat? Was his, was his headline. It was just there. And I can remember the time some of the players, because they couldn't use this stuff, but it was quite simply, we want to explain to them why we're doing this. And also, you know, they were quite interested in the technology side of things. And we brought the very best trainers in. But when we started with some of the software programs available, the key was getting them to use the software to analyze their own performance. But it's on the field of play or off the field of play. And that at the time was just completely groundbreaking. People thought I was starting to bonkers. But, there, you know, and there were one or two casualties. This wasn't a kind of a nice-to-do thing. This was, I mean, this was the line in the sand. Unless you're going to take technology seriously. And I just think today, you know, so many people, so also, you know, when I, when I work with some senior executives, it's, it's amazing, you know, that they, they kind of... Um, Usually, you want to show me some sort of software or data to start with, and I, and I always kind of looked looked half interested for the first like, few minutes. But I'm always going to ask the first question: Who uses this? Who uses this? And almost nine times out of ten, it becomes a badge of honour. That's well, not my job anymore. I'm too senior to do all this. You know, we've got these bright young things from Oxford and Cambridge mm -hmm. who down here. Massive mistake. You, you've already gone away from the technology world. The whole thing of technology is using your experience, make sure you make the right decisions based on what you're actually seeing. So you know. If that's what we call innovation, it wasn't, to me, it was just common sense. You know, I wasn't kind of thinking I'm going to be an innovator, but we weren't tr scared of trying new new things. But technology is absolutely key. It's key today. Everything we're doing, even now, coronavirus, it all comes back to technology and who can move quickest and who can actually adapt quickly to, what, to what's going on. But I guess my Xerox background, my business background, I have no fear of technology because that's that was my that was my job. I was dead to sell technology at a very young age. But one of your businesses now is a, is a technology business, isn't it? With, with Hive as your kind of coaching coaching tool. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that um, and tell us what the ambition of that is? It's very, it's very it's just, it's just gives it some relentless learning. Um, basically, what, what, what we did was it just digitized what I did longhand as a rugby coach. Because when, when we first started, um, I, I used this process where I kind of I break down the game, and we capture knowledge and information. But when we first started, I was capturing all this information just longhand, you know, boxes and boxes and stuff. So it became really clear to me that there was the opportunity. So you just start to capture um, information. And, and this is how I coach people. If I'm going to work with you, Chris, I want you to almost imagine that we're going to write a book about what you do. So the first thing, what are your chapters? How do you break down what you actually do? And once you've got your chapters, we're going to start to capture knowledge and information. I mean, really capture it. So this is where this thing comes in, in hand. So you're capturing all this stuff. You start to really study it. And this is what I call discover. Then you, you, you start to capture this information about the you know, stuff in one of the chapters. Then I use the word, so it's actually called 3D learning. So the first is discover. So you're getting all the information about this. And you never stop learning. You're always discovering, discovering, discovering. So the second B in 3D learning is what I call distill. I've so have all this knowledge. You can try and distill it down to just a few key points. So I have all this amazing stuff. If we do these six things really well, the boat will go faster, whatever we want to say. And the third D in 3D learning is what I call do. So once you know your 
key points, you're, you're, you're distilling down the key points. How do we practice this? How do we do this? And everything else. So your coaching will be creating your chapters, capturing knowledge and information, and then discover, distill, do. And it can all be done on this thing now, so it's with you all, all the time. To show other people. And we're just trying to find out. It's all about knowledge. And so this is what the, the whole hive learning is about. It's about capturing knowledge and in, in, um, in, information, but also we, we provide content on other subjects. So we've got a great program now on diversity and inclusion. The content there is absolutely brilliant, brilliant by some amazing people. Mm. Lady from Fiona Young. So, so it's the same thing. It's all on there, but you just download it in chunks and you learn, 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 learn. So it's capturing your own learnings uh, and being able to both share those with others and, and as you said, you're, you're a sponge and, and enable you to more easily learn from others. Is that is that a, a reasonable summary? Show the people. I'll show you. I'll show anyone I kind of yeah. like. So this one, do what you think. I yeah. think what people do. But also we've got our own content. We've got their own content. Mm. Subjects like diversity inclusion, that you know, because it, it, it's obviously you know the kind of hot topic at the moment, has been for a long time. Got it. Yeah, put forward ideas on that for the hard learning platform. So yeah, I'm hugely proud of it. We started in 2012 after Olympics, and you know, we work we work with some pretty amazing customers now. But you know, the, the number one thing is it's just relentless learning. It's capturing your own knowledge on an ongoing basis, but also mm-hmm. capturing people's knowledge, such as the DNI stuff. That we, we, so I've got I've got a couple of questions there. So I'm just going to remind the audience that they are able to ask questions. So send your questions in, uh, and we'll get to those in a just a couple of minutes. I've got two of my own to finish with. Um, uh, how important has failure been in your journey, Clive? I mean, it's a, it's it's an, an occupational hazard, I guess, as a sports coach. Well, I don't know anybody who's been successful hasn't failed. I mean, it's failings is part of life. I mean. Um, I think I'm probably the few coaches ever talked about failure before we failed. We used to have meetings in the team room about, if we lose this game, what are we going to do? There's no point losing a game of rugby and then Saturday afternoon, five o'clock in the change room, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? So we used to talk about failure. And I think failure, you are going to fail. There's, there's, there's night follows days. It doesn't go like that. So, and, and the key thing is planning for it. So when you do fail, you know how to handle it and handle it quickly. So it's not this massive, big, big fallout. So, um, and I think I learned this very much from my, from my business. I put the business thing. What, what happened? What happens in business? And I was totally guilty of this to start with, with my own small leasing companies. That you know, what happens when you, without being too glib, what happens when you win the big deal? You know, everyone down the pub Friday night, big success. Wow, we won the big deal. Massive overreaction. Then what happens when you lose the big deal? Everyone in Monday morning, eight o'clock, massive. What happened? Big overreaction. What I learned to do was flip that. So in other words. When you lose the big deal, go down the pub, don't overreact. When you win the big deal, everyone in, 8 o'clock Monday morning, why did we win? Why do we win? What are the key points? How can we do it even better? You know, and you hear these terms, you know, like marginal gains and under things 1% better. That's all that is. So, yes, you can learn from failure, but I don't think people learn from success anywhere near as much as they should do. If you keep losing, you've got to get everyone in Monday morning. You know, yeah. I just think it's understanding it's going to happen. Sometimes it just wasn't meant to be. Um, but focus on winning, and you know, and then also you can be pretty tough with your team if you want, you know, because you know you can say we still made these mistakes. What do we do? How do we do it better? So yes, focus on both, but I would wait far more heavily, really studying why you won. And I mean, really studying, and not just taking it for granted that you may have won for these. We're really studying and trying to find out how could we do it better next time. We're going to do it again. Can we do it even better? I think with game of rugby, you could win, win a game of rugby by playing awful. You know, that's Mm. How can we win this better than that way? Get all your team involved, and it kind of kind of works for me. So, and call it success from setbacks. Mm. You know, and we used to talk about it. And, you know, I spoke to sports coaches, and they go, "You could possibly speak to your team about failing." We can, because if you think, you start thinking the ramifications of failure, you don't want to fail, and it's, it can become like, quite motivating. You cry, keep you fail. This is what we're going to have to go through. So let's just part that now. We know what's going to happen if we do lose, but let's now focus on trying to win this thing. So we haven't got to go that path. But no, I've never known any sports coach talk about failure. Fascinating. And, and, and finally, so leadership is often characterized as a lonely place. Um, wh- whether or not you agree with that, do, do you ever feel overwhelmed, or, or, or certainly in the past have you ever felt overwhelmed as a leader by a particular situation or by pressure? Or by your own expectations, as you were in very you were in very public roles in in, in the past. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's a lonely place. I think you could have one or two people close around you. I've been incredibly lucky with my wife, Jane. She, she knows everything. You know, I, I don't come home and leave it leave it out in, in the car. I, I kind of share things with her. And, even, and, 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 the, and the family, you know, you, you can't hide about it. You can't walk the door and be this wonderful, happy-go-lucky person. If you just got beat again, a rugby that you should have won, it's just not, that's not the real world. So they've they've got to understand how to how to be part of it, how to contribute to, to it. But it is it is a lonely place. I've never ever, you know, I can honestly say that I felt I was out of control of the situation. You know, there's, there's been some moments where I just shake my head. Um, you know, and it's uh, it's amazing how good you feel in the morning sometimes, where you know you got to just get to bed early, get some sleep, have a beer, go to bed, and just get up early and start again. You know, just crack on with it. It's not going to go away. But let's not dwell on it all the, all the time. And uh, you know, I, I'm always much better in the morning, just get out of bed early. And the days in the day, right? You know, these, these things happen. And also, you, without being too glib, you, you just thank you, lucky stars. You're healthy, you're fit. You know, you, you're running around, and you just got to. Yeah. You know, a lot of people look at you and just would not feel sorry for you just because you've had a bad time or left you on a rugby or left a big deal or something. This stuff happens. Just get out of bed next morning, yeah. crack, crack on with it quickly. So, um, Clive, I've, I've enjoyed this. I really have. And I could keep going forever. I'm sure you probably couldn't. You've got other things to do. But we've got 15 minutes and we've got lots of questions. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to um, try and try and pick a couple uh, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, uh, there's, first of all, a question about culture. I'm just going to scroll to it. Uh, essentially, I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase. You talked a lot about culture in the rugby uh, team. Were there some players who were you considered to be great players, but who who you essentially cut from the team because they didn't buy into that culture? There was, there was one or two early on. I never named them for obviously. No, no, I, I wasn't expecting you to do that. But I think I think culture is, is great, and I, you know, there, there's one one or two, um, you know, didn't want to learn computers. You could just see behind your back they're taking the mic and all this sort of stuff. So, um, you know, some days they've got to go. The same in business, you know. I, I think you know. Um, you, know you said earlier, oh, talent learns not enough. It could be the most talented person. You know, if, if I'm going to sit down with that person, I'm going to throw everything at you to make you a better player, and I'm not going to get a response back. We might as well just shake hands now. You know, and if you don't get that, fortunately, most of the players understood it. They they they, they kind of got it. One or two, one or two of them maybe didn't, but they probably they were to be honest. They weren't the superstar players. The superstar mm. players got what I was trying to do here. And they really did buy into it, you know, headed up by the, the, the guys you all know. Because, you know, I don't think anyone ever spoke to them like I've spoken to them before. Because I get that, what I learned from my business background, I was just saying, yeah, I think we can win. I think we can win at the very highest level. But I need every individual to make some real commitments here. You've got to become the best player in the world. And I'm going to do everything possible to do that. So the players who didn't have the talent, who, they're the probably ones who kind of had a bit of a fallout with. So, yes, I made some changes. It wasn't really too dramatic, really. But... You, you kind of move on. Um, uh, do you think social media has changed the nature of leadership in sport? Um, players have got huge audiences on Twitter and Instagram, um, and some players have got in trouble for what they've said online. And there's a sort of a corollary to this question, which is, therefore, are you glad you're not coaching now as a result? Oh, no, so social media, um, I think I'm right. The first tweet was sent about... 2006 or seven. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Uh, so you know, if you think the World Rugby World Cup final 2003, you know, I never, as a as a rugby coach, had to really worry too much about social media. Um, but players had newspaper columns, they wrote books. And the Olympics, for example. I, I, I remember hearing you talk about the challenges of the Olympics. Yeah, but by, by the time the Olympics came around in 2012, social media was right up there. So it's like, it's like all things. I actually, I actually like social media. I'm not scared of social media. I just think, again, you need some strong team rules. Okay, we need some real strong team rules on social media. And you just, okay, I want you guys to really think about this. You know, we're trying to be the best team in the world, win Olympic gold medals, whatever you're trying to do. You know, we're not going to remember because we're good at social media. We're causing havoc on social media. So we need to, you know, and with the Olympic team, I think we had about 10 team rules around social media. But none of them were saying, you know, we could have just banned it and tried not to. That would just create a war, we just try to do the opposite to really gauge really gauge with it. Because it's a good thing. So it's, it's, it's actually a good tool if it's used correctly. And but you know, players have, players I think don't know you you are pressing pressing one button, your career is ruined. It, it's mm. serious, serious stuff there. So you've got to take it seriously, you've got to have your teamship rules, you've got to get a buy-in. 
And again, at the Olympic Games in 2012, I was so proud. There wasn't a single, single social media message from any athlete that anyone took offence about. Because we'd done all this work with them about how to handle it, and what to do. So they all used it. And what, what I'd say to, you know, if you think about it, if you're used to using social media and then Olympic Games come up, you stop it. That's not the right behaviour. You want to do, you know, when you go to rugby games, Olympic Games, you want to, your behaviours, the way you live your life, got to be the same. So if you suddenly take this away or ban it, you just create this problem. So this is a case of understanding it, using it correctly. Um, it certainly doesn't scare me in terms of that's not the reason I'm, I'm not coaching at all. I've got to I don't use it that much um, because I find myself reading it too much. What I have found, you know, I, I've really tried to take it off my phone almost. I, I, if, if there's something I think I need to share with people and people might find interesting, I'll go and put it on my Twitter account. But also I don't, I don't go on it. So I just find myself spending far too much time looking at my phone. And life's too short to spend all your life looking at your phone, reading other people's messages. Uh, a question about uh, a person you cited right at the start, Alex Ferguson. Um, how much uh, should leaders use anger? <laughs> Alex Ferguson could famously be furious. Jose Mourinho seems frequently unhappy. <laughs> Shouldn't leaders be optimistic and caring? Uh, the, the answer is, yeah. I mean, Alex Ferguson, for 95% of his time, I <laughs> caring and all that sort of stuff but every now and then you have to know I, I i i did it once being in a rugby team where i absolutely lost it the change room, lost it completely you know and uh see <laughs> but it, it kind of worked because they've never seen me like that before because it i needed to shock them massively shock them and not go through what we normally would do which was kind of this very professional half-time routine and do all this sort of stuff that was it was the classic teacup hair, hair, hair dry moment and you can't do it all the time, or they, they get fed up with it, they just laugh at you. But if, if, when it's needed, you have to be emotional every now and then. But it's just getting the balance right. And I, I, I didn't ever plan to do it, but just every now and then you've got to do it as a, as a coach. And there's been some famous moments with Ferguson, where I think he cut Beckham's lip once or jumped mm. a boot or something, which, which when, you, when, you, when you're in our position, you just sort of smile and says, yeah, I can relate to that. He was just so yeah. mad. And he didn't mean to throw it at him, but he just threw it at him. Mm. But he told me about that, and he obviously didn't aim at it, it was just an accident, but he did chuck something. But yeah, I think that's good. And the same with business. Every now and then, you've got to be, be come across that this is, you're not happy with things. And, but you've just got to, in business, be a little bit more clear in your thinking so you don't actually say something you, that you may really, really regret in terms of upsetting somebody. Hmm. Well, uh, um, is there anything, uh, so is there anything that you look back on either at the Olympics or uh, at the rugby team and think, I would do that differently now if I was in that position again? Like big decisions you faced that you would have changed? I don't know, because you, you've, you've kind of, it's done, you can't change it, you've got to move on. So I would have already learnt if I'd made a bad decision or done something, mm -hmm. I would have sat down on the Monday, don't I just explain to you, you know, what happened. Um, don't, don't do it again, but there's not, there's, it's, all, it's all part of it. As long as you come out the other end one day, kind of smiling, and you can you can really get a bit stressed and start to think, well, should I have done that? Should I have done that? I mean, you know, you, you, the, the time you, you're doing it with the best wills, yeah, you look back and you maybe odd selections would have done it, definitely, maybe, but big deal, you've got to move on, you know, you can't change it. So, no, not, not, we've, not most Chris, to be honest. Uh, so I'm going to squeeze two more in. A um, uh, question from Andrew Wilson. What is the greatest challenge facing leaders today? Uh, and it's a sort of a, an additional question from Andrew. What are your favourite questions to ask of those who you lead? I think the biggest challenge today is what's going on. I mean, you, you, hmm. none of us have ever been trained or even thought about what to do in this situation. Hmm. So I think that's where the real strong leaders will come through. You know, this will, we will look back at this moment in time and hopefully some some organizations, some companies, some teams will come through really, really strong. Others will fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and it's this case of hopefully you'll have had some sort of planning for it going forward. Uh, and it, it, you couldn't have planned for the corona, but a uh, main disaster could have been, happened. So, it's, again, it's just a case of the pl planning, l learning, trying to predict these things um, and actually getting re ready ready for it. And so mm -hmm. I forgot Oh, that question then. The, the, the second part of the question was um, what are your favourite questions to ask of those who you lead? 
Yeah, I just asked them in terms of their learning. Just, just you know, show me what you, show me what you learned today. Show me what you what you're doing. Can they show me anything? Show me their history. And if they can't, we've got to start quickly because if it's all just stuck in your head. The chance that'll be stuck in your head, and you you keep keep forgetting it. So, I, I just want to know, you know, what they do on a regular basis to capture their own learnings, capture their expertise, and how can I help? improve that because I think we can do it better if we if we work through that 3D learning process and get it and the people understanding that. And it's almost like I want to capture your IP. I want to make it better. I want to capture it, study it. How could we how could we make you better at what you actually do? So that's my favorite, favorite question in a roundabout way. Hmm. And and the final question from Francis Cody, I you've talked a lot about this during the past hour, so I think I can guess the answer, but do we need to employ more people in corporations who've run their own small businesses? <laughs> Absolutely. I wouldn't say corporations, I would say governments. I would say people, <laughs> people who are used to making decisions haven't had a big corporation behind them. You know, they really put it on the line because they're, they're the people I really admire, the, the small business mindset. Because it's tough being a small, you know, it's, it's not small in terms of small, it's just the sheer numbers. And I, I think some of the, um, you know, the, the best business leaders I, I know have all started off in their own companies. They've learned and they've learned the good lessons, bad lessons. They've learned how to win. They learn how to fail, which is really important. But they're there to make decisions. And I, I think sometimes top people in companies, they've, they've got there without ever having to really make a decision because they've always had the backing of a big corporation behind them. Same in government. Like, what have they really done when you really get against the wall like we are at the moment? What have they really done to prove they've got the kind of the, the mindset, the bottle, the spine to kind of get through this? Because it's a business. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So, uh, and thank you very much, Clive, for, for your time, for being with us and for the absolutely fascinating chat.